My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school RPG podcast. And in this episode, clever girl, it's the Isle of Dread. Our first segment is the basic crawl. Dungeon module X1, the Isle of Dread, is a 34 page module published in 1981 for the Dungeons and Dragons expert set. It was written by David Cook and Tom Moldvay. The module is billed as the first wilderness adventure for Dungeons and Dragons and is presented as an instructional module to help novice dungeon masters design their own wilderness adventures. There was also a version published for the basic slash expert set, but the one we're looking at today is the expert version. The module is divided into five parts. Part one is the introduction, which outlines the fantasy world that the adventure takes place in. Part two is the Isle of Dread, which is the first stage of the adventure. This section includes how the characters get to the island, notes about exploring the main island, and notes for setting up a base from which to adventure. Highlights from part two include three different wandering monster tables, one of which is chock full of dinosaurs, the village of Tanaroa and its culture, and some exciting keyed location encounters, including rock baboons, rakastas, a giant squid, and a strange species of flying squirrel people, the Phanaton. Part three is the Central Plateau, a much smaller adventuring area and much higher up, where the player characters are again expected to set up camp, this time in the village of Montru. Part four is Taboo Island, which is the climax of the adventure. Taboo Island is located in the center of a great lake. There, the characters will have a dungeon crawl throughout a large temple complex. The temple complex has three levels, with a total of 21 keyed locations, depending on how you count them. Part 4 also contains a section entitled Further Adventures on the Island of Dread, and includes advice for setting up different types of human encounters as well. Part 5 is called New Monsters. This is a bestiary, loaded up with dinosaurs, but also fantasy creatures like the amphibious copra. I'll note that spread throughout the book are numerous maps, as well as a handout in the form of a letter from a long-dead explorer, Rory Barbarossa, pointing out some important details of the island to the adventurers before they set out. So let's talk about our bona fides here. I've only read it, Tom. I used it in the ongoing DCC game, which is an open table thing that I run every week. And we spent, I think, about probably four to six sessions on this, although it's a little hard to keep track of that kind of thing especially because the players sort of moved one of their bases of operations to the pirate cove island that's slightly off the shore off the coast rather from the isle of dread proper so in a way we've visited it almost every session since then as well but um i think yeah the general action of skirting around the edges of the island then heading into the interior getting up to the dungeon and doing that I think that, yeah, that was about five or six sessions in total. Terrific. So things we liked about Isle of Dread. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest here. This was not fun to read. Mm. Uh, (laughs) This is is one of those ones where I wish I had run it and played it, because just reading it is not a great pleasure. The text is dry as a bone or, or dry as a dinosaur fossil, if you will. Well, you know, the thing is, these older modules, they are very... I sometimes forget, I don't know why, but I sometimes forget how utilitarian they are. Like, they're very, very utilitarian. It's like, here is just the information and data and just things you need to know, right? Presented with no artistry whatsoever. But the flip side of that, of course, is that I assume it is actually useful in play? Yeah, that's the thing. And I think it's, um, you're right, the writing for me is not so much the dryness. I I think it has a slightly... uh... (laughs) <laughs> dry wit to it in places like it sort of alludes to things that are quite <laughs> you know like it has has funny titles for some encounters things like that but it yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's one of those books where you have these sort of wait what moments and not in a sort of whoa that's crazy wait what it's where you sort of read a reference to something and you think wait what and then you have to page back a, a couple of bits to find out what it's referring to and, and reread that because you sort of misunderstood it the first time and uh, yeah, it, it doesn't really lay out the f- different threads of things that are going on super well. But I mean, having said that, in play, that kind of works much better because what you really need is a, a short amount of 
pure, cold, hard, dry, fossily data. And for the most part, it's good at that. But again, I think the organ the organization is not terrific. The maps are in some slightly odd places, things like that. So yeah, it's not yeah. a 10 out of 10 on that score. But what, what it actually creates at the table, I would say, is much better than uh, the experience of reading or, or using it as the GM, <laughs> right, yeah. fortunately. Otherwise, uh, this would be quite a dour re- review we're going to do. No, that was my sense for sure. It's actually one of those really interesting history of the hobby things, right? Which we love to do whenever we do these old modules. Because I think it's really interesting that I would say like in the year 2022, gosh, probably 50% or maybe even 75% of what you're buying is just a thing to read for pleasure, right? Like it's all about the visuals. It's about the style. It's about the writing style in a lot of cases. It's about just having a fun thing to read. And if you get to run it, cool, that's great. But if not, you still have picked up something that's enjoyable to peruse and to read and that's just not the case in these older modules and a lot of them at least a lot of the ones we've covered I, I get what you're saying about like there are moments of dry wit i question whether it was intentional some of it mm, um, yep. <laughs> which we could talk about but um in any case the segment is things we liked so yep. let's <laughs> let's go to that i actually did really enjoy the variety and quantity of maps Mm -hmm. i think if i was it's a huge listeners it's a huge number of maps there's so many maps if i was in 19 if it was 1981 and i was just flipping through this i would see all those maps and i would buy it for that reason because even if you don't run this exact adventure those maps are probably very useful in lots of situations how are the maps for you yeah they were good there are other maps available on, on the internet which slightly improve on them in certain ways. I'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, there's the big zoomed out map. There's some continent off to the north, which is part of the established D&D setting that I don't care about. But mainly it's a, like a, a little archipelago and then a big archipelago that the Isle of Dread is in. And then it zooms in. You've got a map of the island itself, also a hex map. Although oddly with, is it seven mile hexes or something strange like that? I can't remember now. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just change it uh, to whatever hex size you use. No one's going to check. And then it zooms in again. So you have different so So it zooms into the, the top of the plateau for when you need that to the village of Tanaroa when you need that bit. And then like to really specific things like uh, nests of certain creatures and things when you need those or just generic cavern maps that you might want. And best of all, it has a version of the map that you give to the players, which only has the coastal hexes filled in. Everything past that is blank because you can't see it from your ship when you approach, which is fantastic. It reminds me of this game that came out uh, getting on for 20 years ago, probably now, I think, called Dark Continent, which was about doing expeditions into Africa. Mm. And it came with a map of Africa that was mostly blank and you were supposed to fill in as you went. And I think Mm. that was a great spur to adventure. The improvement I have found is where people have made that hex map, but in colour now, because the black and white with just the iconography is variations on triangles for mountains, circles for other things. That can be a bit hard to read, especially in a slightly gloomy cafe bar on a Tuesday night. (laughs) (laughs) I have found if you can get a colour version that I think that's an improvement. But yeah, you're right. Overall, and there's so many, so many of them. There's so many maps. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) It's, it's a huge, huge amount of maps. So other things, maybe getting to some more of the substance of the issue. I thought this was a really interesting book in the sense that it's just like one chromosome away from being a campaign setting, right? Like it's really, really close. I think with like 20 or 30 more pages, you could probably run a whole year's worth of campaign in this setting. And it wants you to, right? Like, I thought that was really interesting. Like, it wants you to, like, keep playing on the Isle of Dread. Like, at the end, it kind of gives you this advice, like the further adventures. The book, in general, seems very interested in sort of sparking the DM's imagination and encouraging the DM to create stuff of their own, which I really like that just as philosophy of presentation and design. I think that was really interesting for it. And yeah, my sense is like, this is really, really close to being a campaign setting. It is fleshed out, not quite all the way like it should be for that, but it's really damn close. Like, how's that going for you and your campaign? Yeah, I think so. I mean, our campaign's sort of moved away from that area a bit. Although I will say that the sea area map, that is our campaign map now. Okay, yeah. So like, I've I've labeled like different uh, adventures from other publishers have become 
located on the the smaller islands that you see and yeah i was i was impressed by it i've got to say I, i'm surprised because whenever i'd heard about isle of dread in the past one reason i hadn't tried it before was because people often describe it as I was, it's the one that's like a pulp adventure and it's got dinosaurs. So what I was picturing was the bog standard adventure you might get today, where it's uh, you arrive in an island and you have to go and get a thing and there are some dinosaurs and there were like four encounters. I was not prepared for like the level of variety that's actually yeah, there, you yeah. know, and it's really, it really draws you in. And there's lots of things, like loads of different things to interact with. There are these different groups of creatures and we should talk about that briefly i guess there's sort of the cat people are they the racasta that's it the racastas yeah and then there are the sort of the odd fun monkeys that we never met and i didn't really bother seeking them out because they seem annoying there's the aranea who are the the slightly creepy magic giant spider people spider things yeah and, and then yeah. there are the normal human people that live in the villages in the south and then there are humans living on the plateau as well and all of these but well, they're not exactly factions they don't they're not like vying with each other they just live on the same big island but by coming, you know, your, your player characters can direct or their interactions with these different groups can point them towards each other or not as they choose. And then there's all the wildlife around and there's the treasure hunting and there's a band of pirates lurking off the coast as well, which is great because uh, now our player characters have a pirate ship um, after a series of incidents and not an insignificant number of dragons too yeah i was yeah. also yeah there's a, there's a black dragon on the encounter table and it almost killed our entire party although through what some people are calling dumb luck they instead killed it and uh <laughs> and uh, oh, actually it was a pretty heroic last chance thing by the thief who just sort of had recently found a magic potion in the treasure hoard and decided what the heck i might as well drink it otherwise i'm gonna die and it turned out uh honestly randomly to be just the thing it was a potion of dragon control <laughs> nice <laughs> but um yeah there's like a green dragon in there there's a sea dragon uh, there's yeah loads of uh, uh, even the things that seem so really minor are great for, you know we spent about i would say 20 to 30 minutes pearl fishing and then having one or two characters killed by sharks that showed up yeah yeah it, it's all it's all the stuff of adventure stories which is of course the main inspiration that you can see working through all the threads here or these different Lost World stories, jungle exploration, treasure hunting, like King Solomon's Mines stuff. It's all in there. And it all, because it's in, not quite in the same subgenre, but in the same, you know, pulp magazine, mm -hmm. the stuff you'd find in there from the 30s and 40s kind of feel, uh, it all knits together because of that. It has a similar tone, even if the material differs from one part to the next. Does that come across well, like when you're reading it as well, do you think? Is it accessible? Yeah. yeah, it really does. You're right. I had a similar preconceived idea of Isle of Dread, just because, you know, it's very famous in the hobby. And even if you've never played it, you know it's the dinosaur one, right? Like, you know that. And also the title, Isle of Dread, very pulpy. And I had, like, just an idea what it was going to be like. And it does have some of those elements, but it also feels very fleshed out. This is a pulp adventure. It is, but this is not just a pulp adventure. It's a pulp setting, right? Like we're going to show you like what that means ecologically, factionally. I thought it was really interesting in that way. And that's why I say it's it's very, very close to being a full campaign setting. Yeah. So I, I thought that was really great about it. Uh, yeah, I definitely picked up on that for sure. Let's switch gears a little bit <laughs> because we've a couple times now mentioned the pulpy names of things. I liked this as I was reading it because some of the key locations, it does sound like the authors were trying to evoke pulp adventure stories. So, Lair of the Lizard Men, the Pteranodon Terror, Abode of the Green Dragon. But I can't tell if it was intentional or not because not all of the key locations are named that way. And to some degree, I wonder if this is just like the use of the passive voice making it sound like a pulp adventure title, you know? Like you could just say Lizard Man Lair instead of Lair of the Lizard Man. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think it's intentional here? Are they trying to be pulp I think, sounding? I, think I want them to be, are. but I don't I know if they, they are. I think they must be because, yeah, some of them just say like Aranea Lair. They're quite straightforward. I guess I right. couldn't yeah, think of yeah. a fun one. But then yeah, there's like one that's Pteranodon Terra, which is great because, of course, one of them starts with a P, but it still alliterates so perfect. Right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure they were doing it. It's that kind of weasels ripped my flesh cover line from a pulp mag, isn't it? There's, yeah, yeah I, there's no way. There's no way it's not on purpose. Yeah, sure. I appreciated it when I read into it, but it was just, it, but it's such a half-assed effort overall. You know, like it, it does like help you. To, 
It does help you to remember them, though, I have to say, like, because uh, I think Pteranodon Terror is actually just a, a long rope bridge. Oh, yeah, that's a pulp classic. But... <laughs> yeah. Long, yeah, long rick- rickety yeah. rope bridge. But the bridge wouldn't really stick in your head that much. But Pteranodon Terror, yeah, that's locked in. So it, it's good in that sense. <laughs> Question for you. This is, maybe I should save this for the questions section. I don't know. But it's kind of connected to something I liked about it. The module presents itself, because it says so, as a wilderness teaching module, like wilderness adventure teaching module, like we're going to instruct you how to make your own wilderness adventures. And I don't really see it except just in the sense that it's an example of one. Right? Yeah, like, I, I think like, I don't know I, how like instructional it is. You, you know, know but... I, I feel like that's about as far as it goes as well. It, it sort of it doesn't really draw out whatever the lessons are supposed to be. So uh, right, no, I question yeah, that. Yeah. Unless what they mean is it does explain the procedures for the whole heading into the jungle thing. Like you're at the camp now, you can go this many hexes in the first day, that kind of thing. Maybe oh, that's true. that, yeah, but that's yeah. that's about it. And t- to be honest, when you've once you're at the table and flipping back and forth between entries, you sort of don't read that stuff anymore. Your, your eyes glide over it quite quickly. The thing I want to say about liking is that I do appreciate there. It at least embraces like a notional idea that we're trying to like do something different here, that, I'm, that we're trying to show you something different. And I can kind of appreciate that. There's one paragraph in particular that I thought was really quite good and is great advice for even any type of venture, in my opinion. It says, when describing monster encounters, the DM should not rely only on sight. There are four other senses. Thank you, Dungeons and Dragons. Smell, sound, taste, and feelings of hot, cold, wet, and so forth. The DM should try to vary his or her approach to encounters when possible. For example, the party may first hear the monster crashing through the underbrush or find its tracks instead of just meeting the monster face to face. This is a good way to signal a party that an encounter may be too difficult for them to handle. The DM should also try to avoid letting unplanned wandering monsters disrupt the balance of the adventure. So yeah, I think that's a great bit of advice, right? And I like that the module has that overall sort of orientation of like trying to help DMs present the setting in a cool way. I think that's just commendable and you can really see it being very helpful in 1981 when this was new right like when this was a new activity to engage yeah in, right? yeah so definitely I like it All, that way. although yeah. i think also one of the well interesting things about this module but also a way in which it's good today is i think this is one of the rare older ones we've looked at where arguably it's more fun to play this now than it was at the time of original publication and the reason for that is in 1981 if you rolled a, a Megatherium on the encounter table and you didn't know what that was, like I didn't before <laughs> I got it, and right. then you went to read the description and it, it, I mean, it describes it okay. It's basically a, a massive prehistoric sloth. Sloth? Sloth? No, I don't know. Uh, but in today's modern, exciting future world, you can Google all this stuff and find pictures of either, you know, right. yeah, artist yeah. mock-ups, the bones of the fossils. I mean, there's that sword beak dinosaur that's in there as well. That thing looks awesome, but you'd have no idea in 1981. <laughs> right, yeah. Unless you had the right Time Life book or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, there's no way, yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, no, uh, well, another reason why I think this might even be better to run today is because the module says... Further adventures on the Isle of Dread. Here are some ideas. But now we actually have lots of resources, right? We have lots of things, mm, lots of yeah. Lost World style dungeons, lots of time travel dungeons. We got all kinds of stuff we can put into the Isle of Dread to flesh it out as a campaign setting. So I think, yeah, I think I tend to agree. Isle of Dread's time has come. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's 2022. It's here. Yeah, at last. Anything else you want to say that you liked? Yeah, I'd like to talk about. I think the highlight for us and a sizable chunk of our group's time on the island was spent. In the Tanaroa village, which is mm-hmm, the sort of yeah. biggest central one, there is actually, there's actually a cluster of seven villages around the south of the island, but we didn't go to any of the other ones. And it's it's just fun to visit, right? It's interesting. Mm-hmm. There's this idea that it's a new place that people from the mainland have never seen before, although it's quite close to the mainland. I don't know how that would be possible, but whatever. And I would argue the village on the plateau is a little thinly sketched in comparison. Like it's clearly just a By comparison, like, yeah. stop here to get on your way to the dungeon. But this one, it's this interesting food selection for when you're invited to have dinner. There's a secret society of people who work with the zombie master in the village to raise mm. the dead to work in the fields and whatnot, who are feared by the rest of the people. I thought that's a really rich source of conflict within the village when you get there. A lot of the time when you show up in a fantasy village, it's all just everyone's neighbours. They're all friends and there's rarely any really marked 
conflict apart from maybe some individuals. But this one was is interesting because not only is there that great fantasy cliche upending thing where you see zombies walking around, but they're like, no, that's these are the walking ancestors. Chill. Also, it actually recalls uh, there's this. I'm always a bit hazy on these details. They're called the Zangbeto, who are, are sort of these guardians, stroke unofficial police in certain parts of West Africa. And their costume is this sort of uh, concealing outfit made of uh, straw and things. They would go about at night and supposedly, like, you know, people would be frightened of them. And it's officially a secret society. You're not supposed to know anyone who actually does this. That's why they disguise themselves. I really like that idea of a secret society that everyone knows exists. Yeah, that just feels incredibly interesting to deal with. And the, the players were interested, but they also kind of had to go and get a massive magic pearl from a dungeon so they didn't they didn't spend too much time <laughs> on it yeah. but it, it, it's just it's just really cool and um i don't know there's just something genuinely good about those villages the fact you're in, encouraged to hang around with them do trade deals with them uh, they'd also be a good source of new player characters which i think is mentioned in the text a bit as well and i generated a few zero levels from the villages as well <laughs> right, for when, yeah, when we needed yeah. them <laughs> i found the turn row a bit pretty good the taboo village is also okay but um it's just not as big as not, not as much to interact with. Yeah, this, yeah, know? it's just not fleshed out as much. But no, I agree. Tanaroa was one of the highlights of, of the module for me. There was a surprising amount of care taken mm. in presenting the village in a way that felt it's obviously a fictional people, but nevertheless, there was a potential of it being treated in a way where it like overly exoticizes like a native people. And I didn't really have that feeling at all. I thought it was actually like pretty good. I think for me, the big highlight of the module is. I think Taboo Island is the big highlight for me. I just really like the dungeon crawl. I think the dungeon crawl is is quite good. This temple dungeon crawl, I know you have a question that we'll yeah, cover we'll about one idea. part of it. Yeah, and we'll get to that later. But in general, I really like it. The encounters were really fun. The traps were really good. You've got it's albino mako sharks. You've got giant spitting cobras wrapped around decaying statues. There's a piranha pool. There's a really just devilish fire trap in this thing. And in that last chamber, you have this crusted over mineral throne. I oh, yeah, a, that's great. Yeah, yeah. A rotting king on a throne. I love that. That's that's my jam. It's my favorite. I mean, even, even something as simple as just the varying water levels in the temple because mm-hmm. it's a bit submerged. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's just great to deal with, you know? Yeah, it's a fantastic dungeon. Yeah, I, th- I think even if you weren't going to like run the full Isle of Dread, you just wanted to cherry pick something out of this module. You could just grab the, this dungeon crawl and like throw it wherever you need a dungeon crawl and i think it'd be really great yeah and i will say in defense of the yeah the plateau village is that the taboo island is kind of inhabited by outcasts from that village and so the right the, the yeah. mainstream standard villages are giving you all these dire warnings before you go over there and they can't go over there because it's taboo hence the name uh, which by the way is also uh, <laughs> a kind of plot point in a DCC adventure I played recently. Is it frozen in time? You sort of get hired because, oh yeah, we can't go there, but you could go there. <laughs> you go oh, us, right? how, how convenient. Yeah, is it is literally what we said. But um, uh, one one thing in that village is that they have two chiefs. They have the talking chief, who's a human I guy. Love that. Yeah, that's and they really have good. the chief, yeah. who's a statue. And uh, that reminds me of another uh, this sort of East African thing, which is that the Buganda people of Uganda traditionally uh, had... I think they restored the royal drums recently, so maybe it's back again. I'm not not too sure. Two kings at all times. One physical, who is a human guy Mm. who walks around and talks, and a spiritual one who's represented by a set of royal drums that are used at certain ritual and, you know, specific ceremonial times. But what it means is that even when the the mortal, the physical Kabaka king has died, the Buganda people always have at least one king at all times. And... Mm. um, yeah, in fact, when they showed up, a couple of the players were a little uh, sniffy about the chief. <laughs> so I decided to just make it clear that the chief uh, was like the talking chief wasn't just making it up. <laughs> it's like had him know a few things that he shouldn't know, which is always a fun bit of reversal. Although that's not in the text, I have to say. They leave that undefined, don't they? Well, let's go on to questions we had about the module. Go ahead, Tom. Well, let's do the simpler one first. Is the final dungeon chamber, that big kind of natural cavern with the like lava flows and stuff in it, is it maybe not that great compared to the upper levels? I like it. Okay. And the reason why I like it, so listeners, so you have the proper context, 
It's mostly man-made construction, right? But then the very end, you get to this natural cavern with hot springs, and there's like an amphibious monster in there and some other things. Oh, and the aforementioned mineral throne as well. I really like it, and I think the reason why I like it on paper at least is I like that you are thrusting the player characters back into the natural world. So they're sort of in this like temple space and they're, you know, they're, they're navigating this space where people have tried to dominate the natural world and to create something in it and around it. And then they are quite suddenly pushed back into it. I don't know, just transitionally, it felt really good to me. I think the success of it will probably depend quite a lot on how you present it to the players, right? Like the way you describe that transition from the upper levels into the natural cave I thought the dangers were good. The amphibious creatures I thought were interesting. I thought the geyser dangers were interesting. And I love that mineral throne, this idea of this like crusted over throne. I thought that was really great. I didn't read it and think, oh, this feels like a come down. Uh, yeah, maybe I was just at a low ebb that evening. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you okay. ran it. Like, is that how it came it across? Came off okay. Like... The trouble is, though, that the monsters in there are mind controlling. So we sort of ended up with a situation where one unmind controlled person was hiding from the one who'd knocked out <laughs> pretty much everyone else and stuff. So, yeah. uh, although, I mean, it forced, it did force the players and the characters to get creative about dealing with that. But it also meant quite a few people not really able to do much because they were, had been, you know, captured and stuff, or they were mm, okay. acting against their yeah. best interest. So it was, that was a, li- I felt that was a bit of a problem. I think it was still fun and there was lots of, uh, you know, we still have recriminations to this day about who pushed whom into <laughs> into a pit or not. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe it's not that bad. But yeah, I think that is a that's something to watch out for. Although if you're honestly letting the players make their own decisions, if they've had all the clues about there might be mind controlling monsters down here, which they had had, to be fair. Yeah. Uh yeah. yeah, maybe maybe it's their own fault if that sort of thing happens. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Other questions. How would you handle, I mean, I know what I did, but how would you look at the undertone of ethnocentrism that bobs up and down every so often in this text? Um, I think it's most mm-hmm. obvious in the journal from the, the Barbarossa Captain, letter. Although yeah, yeah. arguably that is in character, so you're not supposed to read that as approving. But then again, you get things like the term witch doctor thrown around without too much care. Sure. One of the yeah, new monster yeah. entries just says native uh, in the appendix. Yeah, yeah. Which is a bit... You know, not great. So I don't know, what, what was your take on that? I was prepared for it to be a lot worse. Yep, same. <laughs> when I was getting ready to read it, I was like, okay, this was published in the early 80s. There are going to be adventurers going into a land with native people. It is clearly inspired by pulp adventures, which are deeply problematic in the year 2022. I was ready for it to be worse, to be honest. When I read it, I thought it was surprisingly pleasantly not too bad (laughs) um (laughs) applying my normal sorts of okay this is an older module you have to have some sort of leeway for changing tastes and sensibilities and definitions of what's problematic and what's not like you have to have like some you have to have some like wiggle room there like with you with your play group with how you receive it in order to have fun with it you have to just be ready for that and so i think i would probably just handle it I would probably handle it in expectation setting, to be honest. Like, it would be a conversation before we even start playing. Like, hey, look, just so you know, this was published in 1981. It kind of deals with these themes and these topics. And it it may not be the best representation of a native island people, right? It's going to have issues of ethnocentrism. It's going to have issues of exoticization and all that stuff. I think I would handle it just sort of beforehand and just run it as it's Written. Yeah, so, that's fair. And actually, because yeah. uh, I don't think it's that bad as it's that's written. The, yeah, like I think, it, I think I've, it, I've seen way worse yeah. things. I know? think it is yeah. an undertone. That's, I, I, what I would say is, I don't think there's anything, no particular facts that you have to change within the setting. So, like, for example, the Tanaroa people are presented as, you know, they're the experts at living on this mm-hmm. island. It's not like a thing where the great white savior shows up and shows the people how to, right. oh, here's some stuff you could be doing with your natural resources. Like, they know how to get the tar from the tar pits. Right. They know how best to defend the big wall that they have north of their village from the dinosaurs and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And where those things do kind of creep in, because it is this sort of implication, I found it was quite easy to just take things literally as they are in the text. So, for example, there's a bit where I think it talks about yeah, this great wall and how it wasn't built by the people 
of the island mm. and it has this sort of like comment like well they're not technologically sophisticated enough right, to yeah, have built yeah. it but of course what it doesn't say is that the player characters are technologically sophisticated enough to have built it and i think in fact they probably would not be right and so that's just how it is like there's a big wall you don't know how it was built but it's massive as long as you don't follow the implications along if, if you just sort of stick with these guys live here this is what they're good at this is what they know what they have available to trade with you and so on then that's okay and the actual facts on the ground are not too much of an issue um as, as you mentioned yeah yeah i don't think they are this is probably a bigger conversation for another time and we've we've kind of done expert delves along these lines anyway yeah, that's true. there is a real reckoning going on like in the culture and particularly in tabletop role-playing games about the effects of colonialism and how like that affects the media we consume and what sorts of things we want to celebrate in our gaming or explore in our gaming and i get that it's hard to do pulp adventure for this exact reason. It's hard to do anything in a Victorian setting because of because mm. of this reason. As the publisher of a game set in Victorian England, it is uh, it's a thing I had to think about. Now the way I handled it was just to s- discard that part of history and say, hey, guess what? In my version of London, anybody can rise up in the ranks of society. Anyone, there's no you're not held back by any particular like identity or aspect of marginalization or anything. Like that's how I handled it. it was just to like turn history off <laughs> yeah yeah but, but of course you you also have to acknowledge that that is its own kind of fantasy don't you so it, it but, is but as long it, as you yeah, as long as you do know that then that's fine it's, it's yeah it's yeah. if you were to sort of be presenting it as if oh actually you know those those women and non-white people would, would have done fine in, in victorian london if they just tried uh, hard right yeah that's yeah, not yeah. The, that's not the situation so yeah yeah it's part of the discussion beforehand right yeah. like it's just you just set expectations and i think that's what you do here too if you're sitting around a table with your group and you're playing any old module i think you have this conversation because you can't prepare perfectly for this kind of thing as a gm things are going to happen things are going to come up that you didn't foresee so you just sort of handle it and and Make sure your safety tools are, are there and all that. And actually, and, uh, speaking of uh, bad actors, the uh, one there is one thing in the inside the scenario that you can use to bring that to the forefront as well, which is the pirates. They're the bad guys. So, you, mm. you know, they are... And, of course, I made their leader be the player character's obnoxious rival from back home anyway, Douglas. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, they, oh, God, this guy again. If you've got the bad guy visitors, the ones who are circling the island and, and grabbing people off fishing boats and stuff, that sort of, I think, acts as a spur to well, just be, be at least be better than Douglas and those pirate guys because they're the worst. <laughs> yeah, that's good. My question is honestly probably more of an expert delve, so don't feel like you have to go too deep here okay. for our purposes. But do you think you could run a campaign where the characters are just like opening up trade routes and things because it says that characters will receive experience points equal to the value in gold pieces of goods sold for opening up a new trade route i imagine that could be if you're just like trying to like level up yeah. if that's your focus like you could probably level up pretty quickly right if you like established a good trade route yeah. i would feel Although, like if yeah, you're just going strictly off you I know think... money generated oh yeah i think it mentions that it only works once though and then you have to start opening new ones. oh okay i must have missed that bit <laughs> but to answer your question uh yeah absolutely uh i have done that in the part i ran my my long running world of dungeons game that was sort of set in Yunsuin but more island based and that was that was what oh, they I did were a doing. similar I did a similar campaign yeah they were learning... using Yunsuin and World of Dungeons oh. actually <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so, so I, don't, I don't know why you're even asking me this question there Jason yeah so right. yeah, yeah hold, a hold yeah. full of tea and uh, and whatever yeah. else and, and trading it for silks and, and spices and wheat and and transporting mercenaries to the keep on the borderlands to help <laughs> help with that thing yeah that's um that all works pretty well and as with things like classic traveler Normally what happens is the crew manages to be disciplined and not have any adventures for a maximum of, I would say, two sessions. And then they accidentally have an adventure because they can't. <laughs> right. Yeah. They, can't, they just can't <laughs> stop themselves. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah, it's a good yeah. time. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah. And I'm, awesome. I'm pleased that it's supported in, in the module to a bit. It's not hugely supported. A bit. Yeah. It's not like a huge a part of it, but it's. No. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to the chain lightning round. Ah. Tom. This is the communal pavilion. It is similar to the pavilions housing the saber-toothed tigers. Inside the pavilion are a number of cushions and rugs. I don't know what's happening on the page one illustration, but I was simultaneously confused, amused, and turned on, so I guess that means it's pretty good. (laughs) The Aranea are a race of highly intelligent, magic-using arachnids, spiders, 
who live in webs strung between trees. They look like huge greenish-brown spiders, about the size of a small pony, with a massive odd-shaped lump on their backs that houses a large brain. There is a giant oyster encounter, and there's a pearl inside the oyster, and the text points out that you can use a knock spell to open it up. I thought that was amusing. Uh, there is an area of weakened floor in the temple dungeon, and uh, two or more people will cause the section of floor to break, dropping the characters to the water-filled room below, taking no damage. This is classic and perfectly timed in its placement in the dungeon. 10 out of 10. Love it. One of the encounters is a, quote, deranged ankylosaurus that's been getting high on something called loco weed. Let's go to the next segment. Hi, listeners. Jason here. If you're enjoying this podcast, you should support it on Patreon. We here at The Gauntlet love making these shows, but there are a lot of costs associated with making them, and we depend on your Patreon support to cover those costs. A monthly $2 pledge doesn't seem like much, but it goes a long way towards us being able to make these podcasts. And if you pledge $6, you get early access to all the releases coming out of Gauntlet Publishing. At any given time, our Patreon feed has scenarios and playbooks for The Between, new mysteries for Brindlewood Bay, incursions for Trophy Dark and Trophy Gold, and more. $6 patrons also get early access to our big standalone game releases. We have four big games coming in 2023, Arkham Herald, Public Access, The Silt vs. RPG, and Moonlight Veil, and you'll get them early and at the best possible price if you make that $6 pledge. Remember, we can't do any of this without you, so head over to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet and pledge today. Thanks. It's the expert Delve. We're talking about dinosaurs. And I'm going to fess up right away to saying that I don't really care about dinosaurs. Um, they're just not my thing. <laughs> they never really have been. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was a young dungeon master, I couldn't understand why anybody would want to have dinosaur encounters when you could have rad shit like displacer beasts and carrion crawlers and rust monsters which is ironic if you know where the rust monster came from historically uh, in the in the monster manual what it was inspired by so yeah dinosaurs are not my thing jurassic park came out and i warmed up to dinosaurs a little bit but even then it was more of dinosaurs through a science fiction lens i still couldn't quite understand what they brought to the table in a fantasy game i think my opinion has changed a lot as an adult but I was just not one of those six-year-olds, right? Like, I was just not one of those kids who ever got into dinosaurs. And so I am here to be convinced. Well, I mean, the good <laughs> Why news, dinosaurs? The, the good news, Jason, is I am, I'm not the one to convince you. I, too, am, I'm not like... I don't dislike dinosaurs, but I'm also not crazy about them. They're fine. If I met a dinosaur, I would greet it politely. You know, I... <laughs> but, but that's the thing, right? I, and I think the, the reason dinosaurs may... Or may not, and I think we should discuss that. Have a place in yeah, your game yeah. is the enthusiasm is often infectious, and some people, a lot of people, really, really like dinosaurs. They like, love a them. Lot. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like how excited I get when there's an airship in something. Like they just, <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice to include things in your game that people really, really like, even if you're not. You know, as long as you don't yeah, hate yeah. it, then you know, do it. I will say in favor of the dinosaur as well. They're varied, you know, there's lots of interesting facts you can look up about them and then that sort of mm -hmm. comes into play and like that's that's an interesting thing. Like I mentioned, the the looking up on Google in Isle of Dread and we'd be sitting there, you know, on our phones like finding pictures of this thing that we just encountered and going, oh, <laughs> right, hey, it, yeah. it could use the bony ridge on its head to do something or other. And we'd all go, oh, um, that is actually quite interesting, even if you're like me and it goes out of your head 10 minutes later. And uh, yeah, they cover all the good, all the monster niches. So they're like a suite of often historically separated by thousands and thousands of years, but like taken as a lump <laughs> right. in the fantasy way. They are like a <laughs> big dinosaur lump. <laughs> a big dinosaur lump. They're like this suite of monsters that, yeah, they, you've got your big ones, your small mean ones, flying ones, the ones that are just really weird. You know, it's it's a whole nicely matched, the three-piece furniture set of, uh, of monster <laughs> furnishings. And, you know, and thanks to children's books and the Jurassic Park franchise, uh, there's a real wealth of visual uh, resources available and tactile ones. You can have dinosaur yeah. toys and stuff if you're if you're so minded. So I think that's um, one way in which they're pretty pretty good. Although I suppose you could you could probably say that about a lot of fantastical monsters and stuff. 
okay, when dinosaurs are part of my gaming, it's almost always, I know it is definitely always, through this, like, sort of campy science fiction or, like, pulp lens, right? Like, obviously pulp adventure games, but also, like, Carcosa, the Carcosa that we've covered on this show, uh, Conan stories, you know. And in these cases, the dinosaurs almost, like, function as... It's not even so much like the what are dinosaurs and what can dinosaurs do and how are they dangerous. It's more like dinosaurs are signaling something, right? They're they're a vibe, right? Their presence signals a lost world or a place that's unstuck in time. I think that's probably one of their principal utilities. Yeah, exactly. They're, if you want that, yeah, if you want that, then they're really great. Although it is curious, isn't it, that you've got, sort of got a fantasy world where dinosaurs don't necessarily exist at a particular time, and yet somehow as soon as a pterosaur or a t-rex is in your adventure it's a lost world valley right. frozen in yeah time. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really make any sense but it's still it doesn't it's make still any sense case. it yeah. doesn't matter it, you, you can't <laughs> fight it you can't go well logically guys actually this dinosaur being here is fine so you know no it right, doesn't matter yeah, the right. the power of semiotics is is that way because it has these themes of because in our minds we know that dinosaurs are found only as bones Mm -hmm. Or, I don't know, maybe scraps of meat frozen in a glacier, I don't know. But it has these themes of something being fossilised in the current era, which means it's frozen in time, it's it's temporally out of place if you're looking at it right now. So, And that, I think, is an issue as well, because it, if you want to use a dinosaur and not have that kind of fantasy, that kind of lost world, things from the past that shouldn't still be here, that's a problem, uh, because you, you're well, going to yeah. have it whether you want it or not they just have this particular valence with people, right? And it's almost unavoidable. And I think for me, when I was thinking about this topic, I kept going back to this question. The question is basically, how important is it that you name them, either generically as dinosaurs or with their specific dinosaur name? Because if I'm following my sort of trophy gold, never speak the monster's name advice, I'm describing a titanic lizard with a terrifying maw walking around on two legs or a pack of small reptilian creatures with colorful fringe around their necks hissing and snapping. The players might put two and two together and think, oh, that's a T-Rex or, oh, that's a whatever the hell that little dinosaur is. Uh, the, or they might not, the right? One, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other one, yeah. Or they might not, right? Uh, the one that killed Newman, right? <laughs> so, but, but like in the case where they don't, and they just think it's some giant fantasy lizard monster. Are they missing out on something then? Is there, like, are they missing out on part of the experience? Are they supposed to be like triggered in a certain way when they see a dinosaur? Like, how important is it? I wonder, man. Because yeah, I suppose it's similar to the thing in like a post-apocalyptic game where where you sort of pretend you don't know what a CD is, um, and and then oh, what's this? What's this shiny disc? And then you, like, shiny disc. You're all happy with all the dramatic the irony. Yeah. But what if one of your players is? I don't know, like my son, who I think doesn't know what a CD is because he's never seen one. <laughs> and, like he asked me the other day, "What is a CD?" <laughs> yeah, is is that player missing out? And that's really hard hard to say. And also, there is that Conan story. I'll mention that probably in the Companion Adventures, where he fights what is clearly a dinosaur, although it's never named, and it's not totally clear what kind of dinosaur it is. Yeah. But yeah, there is. Ah, uh, it's it's a hard question to. It answer. is a hard question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like if you don't ever say, "Oh yeah, by the way, guys, it's a T Rex," you might be missing something, right? You might be like denying the players some particular pleasure at the table if you just describe it as a tall, monstrous lizard. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to say it's a dinosaur, but you certainly want to be pretty explicit about it because you're bringing yeah. it in to have that dinosaur, probably lost world feel. I think. Yeah. Is that yeah. Right? yeah. So. That's definitely an an issue to think about. I think in the Conan story, it's just referred to as a dragon, but then all the rest of the way it's described as you know it's a dinosaur. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that that's confusing. I think another issue actually is to do with naming, and that's that some some people kind of know too much about dinosaurs and they can't really turn that off. <laughs> right. Which yeah. means like imagine that you've added a dinosaur just to for your friend who you know really loves dinosaurs, but then you keep getting all the facts wrong. And that's really annoying her because she's like going, what? No, an Ankylosaurus wouldn't do that, you idiot. And actually, I have a solution for that, which is that you just, you've got to co-opt the knowledge to add to the game. To quote Apocalypse World, disclaim responsibility and just be like, so, hey, what would an Ankylosaurus do at this point? And let your dino expert friend answer that. Because I do this with all kinds of subjects. If I know somebody knows about, I don't know, high speed trains or 
in one vampire game I ran the effects of a flashbang grenade mm. that, you know, you just ask them and uh, they'll tell you and then everyone knows and that's fine. Because, yeah, that would be uh, <laughs> even more frustrating than not having dinosaurs if a player has asked for them would be getting dinosaurs wrong for three hours. What else are we going to say about dinosaurs? Can summarize. So choose dinosaurs wisely like because you actually know what's going to happen when you bring them in. Right, right. Uh, do use the copious... And honestly, like, I've... I spend a lot of time uh, taking my kid to the children's section of the library. Like Kids' books on all kinds of historical and prehistorical subjects are amazing. So go to the library, borrow some children's books to be like at table, visual aids. <laughs> They're amazing. Like The formatting and the layout is just incredible. And uh, yeah, and, and if someone else knows more about dinosaurs than you do, ask them to tell you stuff, right? Uh, I think that's that would be my three yeah. three key takeaways. Sounds good to me. I would just, my, my only takeaway is just um, make sure you, yeah, like what are your goals for including dinosaurs in the campaign? Like what are you trying to accomplish? And I think that affects how you approach it. And with all that said, let's go on to the companion adventures. It's the companion adventures. I only have one thing, so I'll go ahead and say it. And that is Prehistoric Planet from this year from 2022 it is an apple tv plus series and what it is is do you remember blue planet and those other like david attenborough nature documentaries it's that but it's dinosaurs and what they've done is they've divided up just like blue planet is it's got like there's ocean there's desert there's this there's that right forest but it is as if you are watching a nature documentary about dinosaurs. And what I love about this, even though I don't care about dinosaurs as a general matter, I really appreciated what they did with this documentary series because they had to have spent an incredible amount of money and an incredible amount of time to make the dinosaurs look very realistic. They are just wildly realistic looking. And like it, it looks like they literally got a camera and set it in front of a pod of ankylosaurs or whatever and and and, you know and and filmed it if you just want to be like immersed in a theoretical idea of what it might have been like uh, in the time of dinosaurs it's really good it's a very intriguing watch in the sense that you know they're making up at least half this shit you know (laughs) like like they like they don't know for sure this is what why the dinosaurs did x y or z they don't know for sure like their habits and stuff they're just kind of extrapolating from what they think they know but it's an interesting picture that's painted and it's done very very beautifully and amusingly david attenborough narrates it (laughs) Uh, i remember walking with dinosaurs years and years ago they had ken branner doing the narration it's not quite the same thing is it and he can't get (laughs) him anymore like he's got Oscar's money, so um, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go to my stuff. Oh, yeah. So the Conan the Barbarian novella I mentioned previously that is Red Nails from 1936. There's not dinosaurs all the way through, just at the beginning. So if you only want to read that bit, um, and yeah, the thematic idea of things being out of time is plays through in this story because after he and Valeria, I think that's the name of the female character in the movie as well, uh, after they've escaped from this dragon. They find themselves in a sort of buried city where two factions have been fighting an interminable war and they're sort of like a lost world of their own, but a really depressing underground Mm -hmm. one. Thematically, that's why there's a dinosaur at the beginning, or possibly because Howard just thought dinosaurs were cool. I have a game to recommend. That's Escape from Dino Island, which is a PBTA game, um, which I've played a couple of times, had great fun both times. And although I'd say a lot of the meat of the game is setting up your island. So I think Mm -hmm. it's very stealable for other games as well. And that's inspired not just by Jurassic Park, but also by Lost, which, if you haven't seen it, is like a TV series. But instead of an opening credit sequence, it has just a Windows 95 screensaver. And (laughs) but what it draws from that is... uh, Damn, bringing the heat on Lost. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) up up to the minute satire from Fear of a Black Dragon. (laughs) So it has all these sort of ideas of um, mysterious research facilities and things um, that you might discover and and explore, as well as dinosaurs. So, um, yeah, really good fun. And it sort of plays out in, I think it's meant to be either one or two sessions every time. And finally, a quick podcast plug for Monster Man, or specifically the episodes that Mm. are usually Monster Man and Wife, in which James and his wife both talk about dinosaurs. (laughs) And actually, I think there are some other Monster Man-only dinosaur episodes, but... Each of those is uh, worth a listen because, uh, yeah, you'll be able to pick through the vast catalogue of the prehistoric without having to do the research yourself and instead have uh, James explain them to you and uh, see which ones you like the sound of. 
Uh, I think that's it. I think that's all my dinosaur companions. Fantastic. I love it. Well, listeners, that is our show. Fear of a Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. We also have a Discord server. We would love for you to come join us on Discord. We will have a link to that in the show notes. And you can support the show financially at uh, patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Tom, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Thanks also to our Oxfordian editor. Look it up. And thank you, listeners, for listening. Goodbye. Take care.